Hello and welcome to this CNBC Africa special from Port Louis, the capital of Mauritius. We're in the heart of a thriving economy that has ambitions to be the Singapore of the Indian Ocean. Now, we're here to discuss an issue that's on many people's lips these days, the issue of impact investing. That is, putting money into projects not only to make a profit, but also to uplift the people at the same time. Now, we've got some big hitters here to discuss this. We have the Minister of Foreign Affairs for Mauritius, Mr. Arvind Bulel. We have Diane Ristik from Africa Practice. To my right here, we have Ashok Kumar from the Bank of Mauritius. And last but not least, Danashwa Damri of Bumishk Holdings. All people involved with the pulse of the Mauritian economy. So just to start off uh, with yourself, Minister, I mean, how does Mauritius and Africa, you think, regard this concept of impact investing? Well, it is not only a concept, it has to be a reality. And Mauritius is very much poised to play a major role as the center of finance, you know, of the region, uh, the most attractive financial center. And we pride ourselves uh, in saying that we are strategically located and we want to become the gateway between Africa, Asia, and Europe. And being a country which had the, unfold, the, 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 uh, the misfortune or the fortune of being colonized twice, there had, be, there had been a legacy that had been bequeathed to us by the French and the British. And we have a hybrid uh, system of legislation based on the British uh, common law and the French civil law. But we have traveled a long way to set up an international arbitration center. Basically what we've done, put in place the relevant institutional and legislative framework to make Mauritius the attractive destination for onward and outward investment, Africa, Asia, and Europe. But of course, the miles to go, many things that needs to be done. And we look towards Africa as the hinterland. So just coming over here to the right here, that Danashwa, um, this impact investing could be massive. I mean, some of the estimates I've heard today could be 48 billion plus, maybe up to $100 billion could be uh, in investment impact in this continent. <coughs> How big do you see the uh, market being? I, I see the impact market, market being fairly, fairly large. We made an estimate internally, and we think that the market cap of listed African companies around 2020 would be about $1 trillion. And I would safely say, I mean, you take a percentage, even if it's 10% of that goes towards impact investment, you're talking much larger figures than what you just said. So, Ashok, I mean, as the man from the Bank of Mauritius, I mean, you're watching all of this. What do you think is the potential for impact investing? Uh, as you are aware, we have had the financial center, international financial center that is making tremendous progress. And we have had various organizations in which Mauritius plays an important role, like the SADC Commissar. We have positioned ourselves to be the gateway, as the minister just said. And there are a number of funds that have been set up in Mauritius. And we are getting investment from abroad that will be channeled to Africa. We have, for instance, the Maghreb Fund, we have a fund that is uh, directing itself, that is getting investment from abroad and then rechanneling it to Nigeria. We have another fund, right, uh, that is uh, again uh, looking at housing situations. So I think when you look at housing, it's not just especially uh, social housing, it's not just the financial return that we are talking. We are talking also about the environment, we are talking about people, putting people first, and you see it's maximizing, if you want, the financial return subject to social return. So there is an aspect of human values as well in that, in that type of investment. Dayan Rustic from Africa Practice. I mean, in principle, it sounds a great idea. Why didn't people do it all along? Is that not only you get profits, not only you get business, but also people get a share of the cake. Mm. Uh, and one thing this continent must always think about, there's a large amount of highly educated people who don't have a stake in the system or are unemployed, who, if not uh, included in the system, could be a problem. But do you really think, I mean, you're an analyst, I mean, do you think it's gonna take root long term? I mean, it sounds like a good idea, but... I'm not sure whether it's just a good idea or it's going to become a prerequisite. 
Uh, what has happened recently in, in the last decade or so, because of increased democratization of, of decision-making process in Africa, uh, <clears throat> Africa is running out of the type of presidents who would decide everything from the time, what time these schools would open to what kind of foreign direct investment you have, mm -hmm. which means that the parliaments are much more powerful, the local debate is much more important, and that also means that the local population, the business population, those educated Africans you're talking about, have a chance to analyze how much this investment, this foreign investment brings to our country in real terms, or is it just hit and run? And it's increasingly becoming impossible to make a direct investment unless it has a shared advantage. Uh, we have been discussing this with, with clients for some time of creating an investment where the three stakeholders have a shared advantage, the investor, mm. the local community, and the government. And wherever those three overlap, you have a long-term solution. You have a business that can last long-term, where the costs go down because you're not opposed by a local community. And in a way, when you talk about impact investment, we are really talking about investment that is going to be accepted and supported by local community, rather than enforced through law or through public relations, or whatever it is. So I think impact investment is becoming prerequisite. Minister, I mean, what, what, yeah. what role is the state going to play in all of this? This is very relevant in respect of what you've said. We are living in an era of technology where there's constant breakthrough. And therefore, the reach out and the outreach has become a reality. Access to information is no longer a privilege. It is a right. Mm. So the process has to be inclusive. And you're right to point out. The inclusiveness means that you, ha you need to have everybody on board. And you cannot allow anybody to be marginalized. Marginalized. You have to bring everybody on the economic mainstream. But for this to happen, you have to make sure that there is a vibrant private sector. Or you have to enable a private sector uh, to emerge. And also, we need to put emphasis on scaling and reskilling of workforce and adapt to changing circumstances in the light of a new landscape. But there is a better landscape on the African continent because this is virgin territory to a large extent. But you cannot simply move in uh, like new colonizers. So otherwise, you will get trapped and ensnared. So what needs to be done is that you have to move in magnanimously but at the same time, take on board the uh, exigencies and the legitimate exigencies of the people. And at the same time, you need to conclude and contract alliances. And through the buildup of alliances, you can make things happen. We're not talking of allowing things to trickle down. We are talking of equity, but we are talking of fair distribution. But of course, no one comes in for, for, for the joy or the pleasure uh, because no one runs charitable institution. But if we want things to happen, if we want to have an outcome, we need to be practical and pragmatic. What our African friends want? They want predictability, they want reliability. And I will come back to what I said. This is an era where social media can command, can make people earn respect, or can disrupt the whole system if there is no compliance. I mean, one of my issues with this, I mean, and Danashwa, you're uh, in private business, is that it sounds like a great idea. Why wasn't the world doing this all along? <laughs> but surely, though, and you're one of them, shareholders, don't you look at the balance sheet? Don't you look at maximizing your returns? Don't you think of that first and maybe the people second? In fact, uh, today there is a... People are increasingly thinking, how do you define shareholder value? Is it just profits? on the balance sheet, or is it beyond that? So also, if specific to Africa, it's a bit different to the other continents that have seen progress. Africa is the last economic frontier, and clearly the governments also cannot satisfy the needs of their citizens on their own. So the businesses are thinking that they have a purpose also in Africa. 
is just not to create monetary value for their shareholders, but to be accepted in Africa, there, there needs to be a shift in the paradigm of doing business uh, in Africa. But my question is, if people were that altruistic in the first place, you wouldn't need such a thing as impact investment. I agree with you, but unfortunately we were not. And this is why we talk of renewable energy, for instance, today. So we can only learn from the past. But I must say that today the private sector, having learned from the past, whatever was done has been done, cannot be undone. But surely the private sector wants to have a much, much more positive impact wherever they go now, especially in Africa. I mean, Ashok, you're a number cruncher at the Bank of Mauritius. Do you think that shareholders can be altruistic as well as uh, wishing well, for returns? As, as I told you earlier, there is what I call, or what uh, Arthur Lewis called, right, the, the effect of universal factors. And I hear, if you look at the literature and you look at the discussions at various international uh, platforms, you'll find that they are talking about the quadruple bottom line. You have the three Ps. You have, of course, profit for the private sector. You have the planet, the environmental issue. And if we are not realistic, right, the earth will disappear. So people, they are, in, they are rational. So, and there will be pressures for them eventually to take environmental consideration. Like you see in Mauritius, for instance, we're already in all projects, including an environmental impact assessment. Then you have the people, because you cannot grow, you cannot develop. There is no development without putting the people first. And there is this increasingly, increasing trend that people should be aware and they are fighting for the right, etc. And then there is the fourth one, what if you want Margaret Thatcher called, we, right, we are just tenants of this planet, we are just tenants of this earth, so we cannot leave a legacy that our right, that our offspring will then put us to shame. So there is this, what I call the intergenerational equity. So these are the four considerations that probably when you have fund flows going on, that you will find that various bureaucrats, various pressure groups, various NGOs will be taking into account when they are receiving investment. And government, through its budget, through its legislation, will have, before they accept it, take into account these four factors. Because now we are not just, as earlier we just one of the speakers saying, that there is not such sort of a president who are omnipotent. There is pressure around. And people are growing in terms of education, in terms of communication. You find the television in your kitchen every day, every night. So you know what is happening. And you cannot tie the people anywhere. So, Diane, De you're, you're in step with the, uh, the young people you're, as an analyst. You're, you're looking, but do you think this is lofty, liberal, idealistic words here that um, business should be geared to improving the lives of the people who need it? I mean, do you, do you think it's, it's workable in the long term? I think even for businesses who do not wish to do that, as you put it, who are not altruistic, which, mm. by the way, very often depends on whether it's an institutional investor or a private investor. A lot of private investors, second, third generation in Africa and Middle East are now looking at legacy investments. Institutional investor is a different story. They work mm -hmm. up to the returns and they need to report the returns. The young generation has something that has changed completely the ball game. It's very difficult to keep a closet with, with, with skeletons in it mm. because the social media allows them to control the agenda. Uh, I was in Nairobi during the, the bombing or attack on, on the uh, West shopping Gate. mall in yeah. Westlands, yeah, Westgate. It was amazing that all the stakeholders in this tragic affair were tweeting and there was a separate war going on Twitter. Mm. The fact that you can destroy a company who acts in a way that, that destroys the value rather than makes the value over the social media in a way is pushing even the companies who are not altruistic to start thinking about the benefit of the wider community because it's becoming impossible to defend the stand where the profit is the only mm on the agenda, because simply the, we are all consumers, everybody in this room, yourself and myself, we are consumers, and we don't like to be taken for a ride. And if we have a chance to say it, we don't ha all have interviews and panels like you can, <laughs> but uh, if you're a couple of thousand people on LinkedIn or Facebook, you have audience. And 
Check your LinkedIn. You're connected to probably a couple of million people altogether as a power. Minister, go back to the role of the state here. Do you think there is any need to, to legislate for this kind of thing or even give incentives for uh, impact investing? Or do you think it's going to happen of its own accord? No. It's not going to happen on its own accord, although I must say that the geese are looking for soft landing with the, against a the backdrop of crisis, you know, uh, financial and economic crisis in the OECD countries, uh, in, in Europe, and with the uh, appreciation of the, uh, of, the, of the Chinese currency, people, investors, are looking for a soft landing. And Africa provides the platform. But to make things happen, you need to put in place the proper legislative and institutional framework. And for this, you need to have a democratic government. And when you look at investment in many African countries, you'll find that investment is flowing in countries which have embarked upon, uh, proper upon the setting up of proper democratic values, where the demarcation line between democratic institutions have started to become wide. Let me take the case of, of Ethiopia, for example which has a tremendous growth rate compared to other African countries. Massive investment is flowing into the manufacturing sector. There is better uh, government, lesser government, more governance, simply, again, because people are educated and people are made aware of, of their needs. But what is true for Ethiopia is equally true for many countries. Now, if I take the case of Nigeria, of course, I'm not going to say that corruption will become evanescent overnight. But the thing is, when you have people, you know, working at the World Bank, now heading the Ministry of Finance, and people who are conscious of empowerment, of the politics of empowerment, and, and because, you know, the, the commodities are there, they now they talk of value addition. It's not only the export of raw materials, it's value addition. And value addition means downstream products. And downstream products means looking for new market access. And of course, looking at, at best how to brand your products. So there is, I'm not talking of a new mindset in Africa. There is the right mindset that is being put in place. And what is true for one is become true for many African countries. When I refer to the provisions of Agenda 2063, which is a very ambitious agenda, but with clear, uh, uh, with clear outcome and objectives, and I hope and I'm sure that certainly the political, the political commitment uh, would be uh, fulfilled. But it's still, there's still a long way. Much needs to be done. But again, whenever there's a conflict, there's early warning, there's, they, they put in place you know, uh, measures to, to, to resolve conflict and also to address, uh, and also to see and to make sure how best to, uh, 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 to, to move towards a resolution of this conflict and to prevent conflict. So all in all, things are happening. But the question is how to ensure, and, uh, how to ensure that there will be an increase in intra-regional trade. And this uh, in itself is a daunting task. But then you have the NEPA, the New Economic African Partnership for African Development, which is attracting investment from financing agencies, putting in place a relevant uh, legislative and institutional framework to address the issue of supply side. Because we know that if there's a product, we have to move the product. We have to accelerate the program for economic integration. Things are happening, but we need to make sure that it happens in a well-structured manner. So one thing I want to tackle yeah. with you, Minister, and we'll come back to you in a second, yeah. is this role of uh, government in business. I mean, you just said there should perhaps be less government. From a business perspective, uh, what would you say? I mean, do you think there should be less government in business? I mean, not just to this country, but across the continent. Yes, uh, across the continent, I think that uh, there should be probably less government, but more governance mm. uh, in business. What I mean by this is that there needs to be a real partnership between the private sector and the public sector to tackle the societal issues that exist in Africa today in the context of impact investments. And if there is too much 
engagement or influence or <coughs> interference from the government, the private sector may not be able to carry out his, its role uh, as it wishes to do so. So therefore, I think more governance, less government, yes. Okay, Minister, if I can come back to you briefly. Um, I mean, uh, the Ugandan president, Yori Museveni, once said to me, he said, it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than it is to take uh, business out of government in Africa. Um, do you think that the government can retreat more? And do you think also, what my theory is, there's a tipping point in the fact where maybe his governments think they're losing control of their country to, to businessmen and capitalists alike. I mean, what's your view on it? Uh, you see, if you put in place a relevant institutional and legislative framework, and you allow the, the, the and you allow institutions to function properly, and you bring on board uh, people uh, who are the decision makers, and you bring on board the relevant persons to run institutions you give a better visibility to your country. And if there's better visibility, you will attract investment. And at the same time, you need to give security. And the word predictability is very relevant. So to me, in spite of what President Museveni has had stated, the fact remains the process has to be inclusive. Without inclusiveness, be it at the political level, whether we allow it to permeate at all levels, it has to be inclusive. Otherwise, you won't have what I'll call the hands-up policy. The policy will become one sort of hands-out. And Africa has no moral right to live on hands-out because it has all the vast resources. But the question is how best to mobilize those resources to deliver on promises made to the people. Things are happening. There are, all, there are some failed states. There will always re remain failed still, unless international community mobilized to address the issue in a very forceful, meaningful manner. For example, we've seen that things are happening, not at the pace that we'd like, but things are, are, are slowly uh, be, uh, uh, being sorted out in uh, Somalia. But, but these are facts of life, unless and until you know, the, there is the political will, and the political will means what are the resources being also uh, made available to the European Union and to the, uh, to the African Union and to the African Commission? Because they define the parameters to move Africa to become a rising continent. And I, I am very positive looking at Africa as the hinterland. And Mauritius has a prominent role to play as the gateway. So at the end of the day, it is a political will. I'm glad that there's Africa peer review mechanism. We are being peer reviewed. Although there's no, it's not, there's no moral or legal obligation to implement, but we are in the constant gaze. And you see, there will be no investment if there's no transparency, whatever we do. But the opportunities are knocking. That's why I say the geese are looking for soft landing in Ethiopia, in Rwanda, in Mauritius, in South Africa. But on the other hand also, when we subscribe to treaties like trade protocol, we have to make sure that we adhere to the provisions of the trade protocol. It's very important because you have to allow infancy industries also to emerge within, of course, the ambit and the, 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 the uh, within the ambit and compliance of World Trade Organization to facilitate trade. Dan, I mean, you're a man who studies trends in this continent. I mean, one of the questions I always have is this, this huge educated youth, which we talked about earlier mm -hmm. in the program, who uh, feel a little bit disenfranchised. As you said, social media is in their hands. Do you think it's a force for good or a force for trouble? Do you think it can interfere or strengthen the governments of African countries? I think it will absolutely strengthen. Um, I will give you an offline example. Uh, <clears throat> whilst uh, Mauritius is always positioning itself as a gateway to Africa, in Africa practice we use the example of Mauritius with our clients in other African countries in something more than that. There is a concept of politics of consensus here. And the reason there is such 
a concept that, that very often doesn't exist in other countries. It's because the place is small. And when it's small, everybody knows what everybody does. <laughs> now, what social media is doing online, Mauritius is doing offline in a way. <laughs> so what happens here, I always give an example how Minister of Finance here writes to corporations asking for their opinion on the budget, even to NGOs, before the budget comes out. Now, when you say that story, that narrative in some African countries, when we share it, mm. they're, they're saying, you must be kidding me. I said, no, we are not kidding you. <laughs> now, what is happening really, here it's important because it's a small place and you're gonna, if nothing else, you're gonna bump into the other guy all the time. This is what social media does. It contracts the place. There is really nowhere to hide. So when you have a social media, it can be a force for good because it, it forces people to stand in front of the, the, the electorate, in front of their peers sometimes, and say, well, I'm not ashamed of doing bad. And not many people are, have guts to do that. So it's easy to do good then. Yeah. Well, Minister, you're a man in power. I mean, do you, do you fear social media or do you welcome it? We welcome it, but at the same time, we have to err on the principle of caution, which is very relevant. Although at times, you know, you feel that the press can be too overpowering. And you feel like kicking in the shin, but <laughs> it doesn't happen. It's a good thing that we have a vibrant press. And it's important also that the press plays its role in the politics of empowerment. Because at the end of the day, we need to constantly uplift, uh, uh, uplift the social mobility of, uh, for social mobility of people to happen. Now, as I, you know, uh, to me, as I've stated earlier, access to information is a right and no longer a privilege. If we've seen what has happened in uh, Egypt, in Tunisia, and elsewhere, but at the same time, it should not, when you have a disruption of an alleged establishment, as it used to be, and I say alleged, uh, in our endeavor, to fulfill our legitimate ambitions for the people, we should not allow any superpower to walk in and to disrupt the system in such a manner that it's become difficult uh, to reconstruct. Because reconstruction is very important. So you have to make sure that you strike the right balance. I'm glad to see that things are happening the slowly in, in, in Mali. I, I, I referred earlier to uh, 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 Somalia. But we have to tread cautiously. Give the people their legitimate rights. And let us fully subscribe to the provisions of human rights, OK, if we want to make things happen. So that's why I say we should not be caught off guard. But what needs to be done with the support of the international community is to make things happen for the betterment of nations. Okay, Minister, gentlemen, hold those thoughts there. We're going to go to a break now. And uh, we're here in Port Louis in Mauritius for a CNBC Africa special talking about the possibilities and problems of impact investing. Do stay with us. Come back after the break. Welcome back to Port Louis, the capital of Mauritius, for this CNBC Africa special. And we're looking into the question of impact investment, its problems and its possibilities. So we've had a robust discussion in the, in the first half. And one of the points I want to raise, and uh, the national, I think this is your territory, is um, there's been talk that the Stock Exchange of Mauritius is going to launch a board within its current setup to specialize in impact investment. I mean, what do you think of the possibilities of this? Yes, uh, this, is, this is in fact a, a very good initiative and uh, it is not an initiative by one stock exchange only. Uh, as you're aware, Chris, as I explained to you earlier, I'm also setting up a stock exchange, a Pan-African stock exchange that will go live in quarter one 2015 out of Mauritius. And we are thinking along similar lines about what I would call a social board. I know other exchanges are thinking of sustainability index. 
So this is when, when, we, when I intervened in the debate earlier today, this is when I spoke about what is shareholder value today. Of course, shareholders, you need to return profits. But there is this increasing pressure for profits with purpose, especially in Africa. Profits is, you cannot dispute that. You cannot have a business without profits. Let's be clear on that. Mm. But if the profits serve a purpose, that is very good. And triple bottom line is coming more and more common. So I think it's a very welcome initiative by the Stock Exchange of Mauritius. It will be among the first exchanges in Africa uh, to bring such an initiative. And I think this you'll, you'll see many more developments across the globe uh, with similar, uh, similar boards. Ashok, what do you think the prospects are of it? I think, uh, as I said earlier, we have built things, what I call the asset of nothing. And one of the earlier things from the history of Mauritius is that when we do not, we were a resource star, we did not have any resources, we, in a way, build institutions. We increase our capacity building, and that this was a valuable asset. The stock exchange is one of them, and over its short history, each time it has innovated. It has, for example, set up the platform, creating the enabling environment, creating the propitious climate for people to invest, right, to go to there. It has to meet the demand in Africa. It has set it in such a way that people can invest small sums. And even it has innovated in a way where people do not have to get to fill the whole thing. You can build your funds slowly over a period of years. So this has been slow. Uh, innovations to respond to the market because there is some sort of reluctance among investors in Africa, all of them to invest at the same time. So you can set up something. Now, when it comes to the second idea, and it is taking the, what I call a universal trend coming in, and you have an obligation as a country because you have to create the respectability, the trust in Mauritius, so they come because eventually why Mauritius is becoming the number one, uh, getting into the various indices, the Mo Ibrahim, in the world heritage among others, is because there is credibility in terms of governance. So you have another institution that plays that role, this boosts the image of Mauritius, and others trust Mauritius, they channel their funds, and they also get the sort of data, the sort of information in terms of indices, what they stand in the international and in the regional uh, platform. So I think it's a very bright idea, and uh, the stock exchange, I am sure, would be moving faster than they have said in that direction. <laughs> Impact investment is so new, this idea of making profits and uplifting the people at the same time. They were worried that people actually had the, the concept of it and the wherewithal uh, to fit their investments into what's required. I mean, what, what do you think? Well, it's an issue of accountability. We know how to measure profits, we can count it. How do you measure impact? Uh, so, and how do you express that impact in which units is, in a way, impact investment is like moving from uh, love, we're doing it for the love for money, <laughs> and now we are separating love and money and saying we're doing it both for love and money. So I think that's going to be the key issue, because if you look at uh, all the charitable and good money and impact money given to non-profitable organizations, you will see how much of it is wasted. Mm -hmm. So the key issue here is who is accountable and how is one accountable? I'll give an example of unexpected impacts. Apollo Brahma Hospital is the world-class hospital in a region that many countries are battling even with basic healthcare. And it looks like a profit investment. But when we recently went to Nairobi and said, uh, listen, Apollo Brahma Hospital is bringing the first robot, surgical robot in this area. And we would like you to have your doc best surgeons ready to come and train on this robot. Now you're creating an impact investment through very unexpected ways. You're raising the life of the people who raise the standard of other people's lives, doctors from those countries. You're also keeping the investment and uh, the business and cooperation and the growth of science within a region. Now, is this an impact investment? Does it necessarily have to be an investment for very poor people? Can it be targeting somebody as educated as a surgeon in Africa, who you know. So this is how we need to debate more about what is the impact and how we're going to measure this impact. Is it the role of media? Is it the role of some auditor? Is it the government's role? Um, this, is, this stays and remains unresolved. 
But I maintain that the market can resolve it. Look in Pesa. Uh, every woman, even a literate woman next to the roadside in Kenya, can now receive money as if she owns a credit card machine. Mm. Look at the impact on Kenya. It's it democratized completely the economy. The same thing was taken to Afghanistan. And when they started paying police force in Afghanistan in Pesa, they discovered that 25% police percent of police force is ghost police force. <laughs> so, I mean, that's an impact investment, if you think about in Pesa. I believe that opening a regional center of excellence is an impact investment, because when you talk about healthcare in Africa, everybody talks about Ebola and malaria. But you're saying, why? We can have one regional, one international center that can compete with Europe and India. And to me, that's an impact investment. I don't know whether everybody will agree, though. So that's going to remain the issue, yeah? So, Minister, how likely is it that the investment will come? I mean, let me tell you, in the last three years, as the editor of Forbes Africa magazine, I've interviewed some of the most hard-nosed and successful businessmen uh, on this continent. And I'm sure that one or two of them, if I said, look, you know, is your, uh, are your profits, are they uplifting the people? They might say, I don't know. So what? I don't know. I mean, it's, a, it, it's yeah. unfortunately, capital can be hard that way sometimes. But, but you know, at the end of the day, if we want to widen the circle of opportunities, we all have a moral obligation to make things happen. Because we cannot be an oasis in a vast, barren territory. And we know what the consequences are the social consequence, the social disruption. So I think we have this moral obligation. Let me take the case of Mauritius. My friends earlier told of the, uh, you know, there were of early harvest. Sometimes there was no harvest at all. And we had to set up a special uh, uh, a portfolio, a special ministry, to ensure that the politics of social integration uh, uh, becomes the norm and standard of our, uh, of our nation. Because you, it's an endless debate. Where do people come? You need to, to generate the profit. You cannot simply put people uh, before profit. But we all have this moral obligation. My friend was talking earlier about the post-tax 2% uh, profit that is credited to an account to ensure that the Ministry of Social Integration acts also as, uh, as the, uh, the ministry which ensures oversight. And the money is, uh, is, uh, which is disbursed, sometimes up front, is money disbursed after both private and public sector have studied proposals made in respect of, of submissions of projects. So now how do you uh, account for this within the big continent? There's a need for proper decentralization to ensure that the politics of empowerment becomes a reality, from minor micro projects to, uh, to small and medium sized projects. So the politics of empowerment has, has to be clearly defined. For example, in respect of startup, what are the accompanying measures and incentives you give? What I'm saying is that everybody needs to have a sense of belonging, because at the end of, of the day, the ownership of commodities, of resources which are being harnessed with value addition, belong to the whole nation. And if we should not simply uh, empower uh, a handful, because we know what the consequences are. So my feeling is that you know, if we want to widen the circle of opportunities, we need to generate the wealth. And at the same time, we have to make sure that the process is inclusive you need to take everybody on board. I'm not saying that we run charitable institutions, far from it. But we know what has happened in areas, in countries, where commodities have been exploited at the expense of the people. So this, these days are gone. But at the same time, governance. And governance starts high up. And therefore, the politicians at the helm has to act responsibly. And there is a need and a call for an act of faith to ensure that we empower the people. I mean, Dan Ashwood, just as a businessman, the other thing that strikes me always about this impact investing is that the number of projects on this continent uh, that could be successfully done. I'll just give you an example. I mean, where I live in Johannesburg, there's a big problem with the uh, traffic lights going down and there are accidents and what have you, and quantum of chaos. One of the insurance companies employs a massive squad 
of people to go out and direct traffic. And obviously the thinking is if they avoid um, accidents, they don't pay out insurance premiums, they save a fortune. And just one simple idea. Um, I don't know, I mean, how many of these ideas could you see? I mean, do you think it's going to take up this kind of thing? I, 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 think, I think it will take, take time because it's, uh, it's very new. And one of the largest problems in Africa is corruption and the lack of transparency. So whenever you're talking about doing social good, most of the time the private sector doesn't do it itself. It gives it to somebody to do it, generally NGOs or through their CSR policy. And now we talk, maybe if there's an impact investment board, maybe the funding would be through that, uh, through that channel. So it's a nice idea. <laughs> but uh, unless you really resolve this problem of lack of transparency, and reduce corruption. I personally, as a private sector person, I do not see companies diverting too many resources and capital towards impact investment. Controversial, but that's what I think. Because this, this is one of the issues. I mean, it almost overlaps with so-called CSR, corporate social responsibility uh, spending. Um, and that can often run into trouble. I mean, we ran a, a piece in Forbes Africa a few months ago about in Lesotho, one of the big uh, clothes manufacturers in Europe, said, wouldn't it be a nice idea to set up a factory and uh, create jobs, which was fine until they found out that it was being, child labor was being used. And as the journalist who wrote the story said, nobody checked, nobody bothered to follow through. I mean, isn't there a danger that this might happen with impact investing as well? I think that a lot of people who are currently giving money to NGOs are considering to push it through the private sector that has a better way of regulating itself. You will see that in every country, NGO sector is less regulated than, than the private sector, to start with, by legislations. Yeah? So the money for investment will not only come from capital, it will also come from donors. They might find it more efficient because currently, in some cases, only 10, 10 cents out of a dollar of the money you give reaches the ground. The rest of it is spent on administration, on, on expensive cars, on four-wheel drives, on, on uh, salaries and so on. Uh, there is a huge danger to misappropriate this money if there is no regulatory framework. That's right. Mm. There's a huge danger. And when I say huge danger, I'm, I'm just being kind. Mm. It's 100% guaranteed it's going to happen unless there is a regulatory framework. The so, minister, I mean, isn't there a case here then for the state to be like a policeman when it comes to That's why to these I earlier matters? talk of yeah. oversight. But you are right. We need proper regulatory framework. Mm. And if NGOs, and NGOs uh, have great ambitions, which I share, if they want to be part of the decision making process, they have to assume their responsibilities fully and they have to be accountable. It's easy to take to task government because government is, is accountable. They face the electorate. Now, it is true also that NGOs you know, do have to face their own electorate, their own constituents. But at the same time, unless and until the system is properly regulated and there's proper oversight with full accountability, we know what the consequences are. But again, everything starts at the top. It is the signals you send and the message you convey. You send the wrong signal, if the country fails, everybody fails. So we all have moral and legal obligation to succeed. Now, I'm not uh, too optimistic, but I think we have to make sure that we comply and we comply fully. And when legislation is enacted, compliance should become the, the, the norm and standard. I mean, Ashok, um, from Bank of Mauritius point of view, do you think there's enough uh, framework and apparatus and skills there for compliance in something like this? Yeah, from the Bank of, uh, from the Bank of Mauritius point of view, in terms of financial inclusion or in the financial sector, we carry out supervision. But maybe I should share also my experience when we started industrialization because these problems you mentioned earlier of child labor, we put an enforcement system, we had the legislation, but there was, there was also education behind it, right? There was mm -hmm. also what we go, as you educate the people, you have 
the press reporting. So it's not a single factor that plays it. You have the politician, you have the educators, you have people getting educated. For example, in the case of Mauritius, the 1976 decision of giving free education was a major factor in creating awareness in terms of not only uh, technical knowledge, but also of good citizenship. It is easier to lead a nation than to enslave them without education. That's what education in a way. And as we have progress, we have gone to tertiary education. There has always been that urge to improve and improve. And the moment that we fall down, you have a host of, of criticism. For example, when we find that there has been a proliferation recently of substandard schools, we had people coming, Nobel Prize winner Michael Porter came here, and he commented, and people started taking this into account, what other people were saying. So we are also a uh, recipient of good advice of others. Now, whatever people have said, our civil service, right, is one of the most efficient. If you look at some of the institutions that have worked, People were criticizing, but if you look at the former Ministry of Industry, when we were uh, looking at uh, giving permits and doing things, and even pollution at that time was not an integral part of, of the legislation, but we took the initiative and even created eventually a Ministry of Environment. And today we have an environmental impact assessment for major projects. So gradually we have monitored all these things. We have shifted from one pillar to the other. We attend, and, and the good thing about the Proelium Mauritius is that we don't go in a big delegation, so we are very cost effective. <laughs> we have one person, two persons go there, and when they come, we expect them to do something. We expect there's a learning process around this. <laughs> so in a way, the, the civil service has been quite responsible. I will not say that there are, that there are not inefficiency in it, but from a general point of view, we have had a good civil service, even though it is a little overstaffed. We could do a better job like this. Now, we look at the legislation. When we do a legislation, we try to look for advice from a World Bank consultant, from IMF consultant. We carry out a consultancy exercise before taking it. And although some of the people inside the ministry or inside have put suggestions, but we took an outsider to coordinate it, to give us, to polish these views. And what we do, again, we, we go slowly, consulting. Earlier, you talk about the private sector and public sector synergy. So this is a very important process, and it goes out at various stage of decision making. And our Westminster style government, there is a way of how decision and how we start implementing all these things. So all these create the right, the propitious climate in the country to push an idea. Now, if you look, for example, we are now, we have been toying with the idea, for example, of the land-based ocean industry. We have about 1.3 million kilometers, and I think it's going to be a success sooner or later. We have spent some time, but small, little by little, the ideas are coming, for example, generating energy from that sector trying say, to look at some of the raw materials. We, are, we have been used to take more that it is a resource starved country. But in fact, we have abundance of resources in the CRL. And probably the next budget and the next generation will be focusing on how to use this 1.3 million kilometers of sea to create the next pillar of growth. And Probably we'll have to go through the same process that we did with industrialization, with the financial sector by creating capacity building, uh, training people in that area, probably creating a faculty at the universities, training people to go abroad, probably to universities like Bristol, like Southampton, where they have an exposure to the sea. So this is how Borussia has slowly built its uh, development. Bearing all that in mind, I mean, Dinesh, do you think the world is ready? with the controls, with the altruism maybe, to make a go of this impact investing? From, from a purely selfish, capitalistic point of view, they add cost. Yeah, and they okay. reduce your profits. It's like the CSR. Okay? People said, like, it's a cost. We're taking off our bottom line. Maybe is it something we can do if we've got a bit of spare cash at the end of the year? That's what would worry me about it. Exactly. That, that's, a bit, that's a bit the thoughts of, of, of a lot of the private sector companies today. And you had in America, especially, we, I don't know if you know about the Walmart, the Walmart case and mm. the CSR and, and all these. Yes. They, these are proven examples of what happened and what they did, what they did not do. But in the context of Africa, it's different. Mm. Africa is, needs uh, solutions uh, for its people. 
And I think the whole world today accepts that aid is probably not the right method of going into Africa. And you can, aid is not sustainable. So you're necessarily looking at enterprises that make profits with a purpose. So I think in the case, and if I may just touch, touch on one point of view, I think for Africa also, we spoke about NGOs earlier. My personal opinion is that we should have more social enterprises and not NGOs, because NGOs in Africa, I'm not sure if they'll be sustainable with aid. So I believe that in the context of Africa, I would say, it's a big statement, I would say yes, we are ready, the mindset is changing, and I think we will see many, many more developments on impact investment in Africa. And I think Africa will leapfrog the developed the develop markets in impact investments. Well, this is something I agree with. I'm sure you do too, Minister. Surely anything is better than aid. I mean, this continent needs trade. I mean, what's the That's view right. of the you government know, of Mauritius? The, this is ma the mantra on the continent, trade and not aid. But to have trade, you need to put in place the relevant system. Let us start at what we should do better at home. We need intra-regional trade. We need to address supply-side constraint. We need to have the right mindset because we have to make sure that we stay ahead of the curve. And to do this, we start at home. For a, from maritime corridor to rail corridor, these are the things that have to be addressed. But we need to empower people. What about the skilling program? Because I've told you, the geese are looking for soft landing. Manufacturing sector, look what, what India is doing. First, development in India. Development in Africa. And we can make it happen. I'm, you know, uh, I'm not pessimist. I agree we have to err on the principle of caution. From a continent which was a losing continent, it has become a continent where the aspiration is high. But unless and until the process is inclusive, it's there, it's happening, but not at the pace that we'd like it uh, to happen. I think we can, uh, we, we can use Mauritius as the showcase for better things to happen on the African continent. And I don't know of any continent with so, much, with so much resources as Africa. So I think the lion will roar for the betterment of the people. And Dan, just briefly, because I'm going to go around in a second and just get you all to sum up what you think. I mean, do you think this optimism is, is well placed in the continent? Many years ago, when we talked about resources in Africa, we were referring to mining resources. Mm. The biggest resource in Africa currently is its people, mm. because it's now educated workforce and the more than solutions they're looking for partnerships. If anybody thinks that they can invest into Africa by showing strength through money or knowledge, they are mistaken. African leaders, African population, African businesses, our experience are looking for partners, people who want to stay and jointly build a solution that are applicable to Africa and at profitable levels, of course, but beneficial locally. So I think that marriage, profitability with impact, that will work. Okay, we're afraid we're running out of time now, but I want to go around all of you and just ask you to sum up, do you think that this impact <clears throat> investment could be one of the answers to the economic future of Africa? Starting with you, sir. Certainly, I, I believe that uh, impact investment in Africa will be a reality. I believe that the African continent will innovate business models to showcase to the world how impact investments can be used as an economic prosperity mechanism. Ashok. I also share the same view. I think probably we've a newly educated new generation, younger people, aware of what is happening from an environmental point of view and conscious that they have the potential. Africa is the hope of the future, right? And I, I, I believe that when they are going to implement the next generation, they have had the statistics show, they have had sustained growth. Now they are standing on firmer ground. They have now built their own confidence and they are going to take right, the opportunity to correct it at an earlier stage. Diane. 
Absolutely. As long as it doesn't turn into a condescending capitalism, but accepts that Africans know how to handle their own economy and they do need partnerships. Minister. Inclusiveness, industrialization, value addition, market access. And I'm sure the impact will be felt throughout. Thank you very much, Arvin Bulel, the Foreign Minister of Mauritius, Diane Ristik from Africa Practice, Ashok Kumar from the Bank of Mauritius, and Nashwa Damri of Boomish Holdings. Thank you very much for your view. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for from this CNBC Africa special from Port Louis in Mauritius. From me, Chris Bishop, it's goodbye.